Um, the message today is on healthy sexuality. Yay! We said that word in church. <laughs> it's important in this day and age that we talk about this. Amen? It's really important that we talk about this in this day, in this day and age. Um, confusion is running rampant. Confusion is running rampant, and it's not just in the world, it's in the church. Amen? There's confusion. People don't understand. They're not sure what to think. It's like, oh, gosh, well, we want to be nice people and all these different things. And so today is really just going to be a vision casting um, for what God originally intended. Amen? Um, so we've seen um, many church leaders failing in this area. Yes? Yes? And it's disheartening, right? And so it is important that we talk about this. This is important. I've seen this thing used um, wrongly. Um, take out marriages, take out people, take out ministries, um, take people out of, you know, government and politics and, and those types of things. Um, one third of all people, I believe that's the, st the statistic now, if it's not more, one third of all people are sexually abused as children. This is something that we need to talk about. Yeah. Amen? Um, Christian kids, for every 100 hours of receiving sexual agendas and messages from the world, they receive one second of biblical truth. For every 100 hours of receiving sexual agendas and messages from the world, they receive one second of biblical truth. Amen? Uh, they're, they're getting educated by TikTok, y'all. <laughs> like, this is, this is important that we talk about this in church, okay? Um, it's important to understand that we are not animals. <laughs> Who wants to amen me on that? <laughs> amen me or moo, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, ha, ha, no. <laughs> we are not animals. One of the, the greatest lies that has come against humanity is that we come from monkeys. Why, why is that so, such a bad thing? Okay, this, this is a quote from Bill Johnson. This is, um, you know, Bill Johnson's brilliant. When you get rid of the creator, you get rid of design. When you get rid of design, you get rid of purpose. When you get rid of purpose, you destroy the thought of responsibility and accountability. Accountability is the responsibility to answer for your choices. When you destroy the concept of everyone giving an account to God for their life, then you've completely dismantled the fear of God. And the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? Okay? So we want to operate in the fear of God. And, and when I say fear, I mean a healthy respect. I mean a fear that's like uh, it matters what he thinks because he is God. Amen? He is the Alpha and he's the Omega. He's the creator of everything that we've seen and known. And for us to rise up in pride against him and say, well, we think we know better, right? It's, we're not operating in the fear of God. And now how many of you know that God is a good father, right? He doesn't put things out of reach to us to be mean or to test us or to see if we'll break a rule. He is a good father and he knows what he created us for and he knows the things that are going to tie and twist us up in bondage. And so he's a good father when he says, this is how I want you to use this. Amen. So with that, Father God, we just thank you for who you are, and we just welcome your presence into this place. Holy Spirit, have your way. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would uh, speak only what you can speak to each person, Father, individually. I pray for your anointing upon this time, Father, that we would not only um, hear knowledge, God, but that we would actually encounter you, encounter the voice of truth in this place. I bind up every spirit of religion in this place in Jesus' name. I bind up every spirit of shame and condemnation in this place right now. In the name of Jesus, I bind up every spirit of perversion and every spirit of offense and pride right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, um, for just who you are. And, and we just um, welcome your input <laughs> in Jesus' name. Everyone just put your hand on your heart and just say, Holy Spirit, I want to hear from you today. Yeah, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, this is a vision casting. This is like, this is foundation laying. Um, none of this is meant to bring shame or condemnation in any way. Um, when I've preached on this stuff before, people will tell me, oh my gosh, you know, that makes so much sense, but it's too late for me. Or, oh man, I wish I would have known this when I was such and such age. Um, and I just want you to know that Jesus is the best redeemer 
that there is nothing that's too late. There's nothing that's too lost. There's nothing that's too far gone. He can restore all the things. He can restore purity. He can restore your emotions. He can heal all your wounds. And he is very, very good at his job. Amen. So as we listen to this kind of factory reset to the design that he intended, I want you to hear through the voice of a loving father and not the accuser that would bring shame and condemnation. Amen. And I know for many of you, um, the door was opened in a very wrong and abusive way. And I am very sorry for, for that door being opened to you in a way that was wrong or perverted, where it was forced on you, or you just didn't even know um, what was happening. And so I understand that. So no shame, no condemnation. Amen? Someone say, shame is my enemy. Shame is my enemy. Yes. Someone say, condemnation is my enemy. Condemnation is my enemy. Amen. Um, shame only keeps us in bondage. That's shame's job, is to keep you in hiding, to keep you, like, sit down, shut up, you know, don't get free. That's what shame's job is. It keeps you in bondage. Amen? All right. No shame. Um, this is going to be a factory reset. So Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Can we all say that together? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Genesis 1, 26 to 28 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over. Someone say rule over. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So in other words... We were created to rule over creation. We were created to take dominion. Amen? We were never meant to be ruled over by creation. Amen? We are meant to be the authority. We're meant to be the ones that are, are watching over and stewarding and taking care of the earth and the animals and all those things. Amen? Um, now, um, man was created in God's image, male and female. What does that mean? That in the image of male and female as one contains the image that God says, this is what I am like, both male and female, okay? So God has male attributes. God has feminine attributes. If that offends you, then you might want to take a look at Scripture to see that God has feminine attributes, okay? Otherwise, where did women come from, right? Contained in male and female was the image of God, okay? And you see all over Scripture, God refers to himself as a loving mother hen or a protective mother bear, okay? So there is a mothering, nurturing side to God, and then there is also the father, the masculine side of God. Does this make sense? Okay, so in, in that image is who God is, and that is part of the reason that it's really important that we keep things clear, that God only ever intended male and female and nothing beyond that. And it's not because he's mean, it's because he's a good God, it's because he's a good father. Okay, so if those things were okay with the Lord, if those things are like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, God created some people to have these desires, you know, for the same sex or to become a different sex, then God's not a very good God. Like, he didn't do a very good job creating us. Like, we don't have the body parts that we need. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, we're we're going to get a little nitty-gritty <laughs> with this stuff, but, you know, it, we don't have the body parts for that to be the ultimate fulfillment of what God designed. Amen. So if that's something that he intended or that he's okay with, he's just not a very good creator or he's not a very loving father. Amen. Okay. There, there's actual physical pain and, um, and issues in the body that occur with two males. Does this make sense? Is that a good father that would create his creation to, you know, partake of that? No, it, it, that, that brings sorrow, right? The, the Lord says, my blessing like makes you rich and I add no sorrow to it. 
So there should be no sorrow added to this thing. Okay? Amen? All right. Um, The first command that was given to man was go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. What is that referring to? Sex. Yes. We can say it in church. Okay? On the count of three, everybody just say it. One, two, three. Sex. (laughs) God created sex. The devil did not create sex. And God created sex to be a beautiful, wonderful thing that was created within the context of marriage. Amen? It's one of his greatest gifts to mankind. Amen? All right, everyone's getting bashful on me. (laughs) All right, let's put up on the screens Genesis 2, 21 to 25. 2, 21 to 25. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman. By the way, I love that it says fashioned into a woman because we all love fashion, right? Uh, The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, or some people say, whoa, man, (laughs) because she was taken out of man. Amen. Is that the end of that? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Amen. So, Woman comes out of man, and the first time man sees woman, what happens? He he sings. He prophesies, oh, my goodness, when can we be together again? Right? So it's like we have male and female. They were pried apart, and the very first thing out of his mouth is, we need to be joined back together. And I will leave my father and my mother, and we will be covenanted together forever, and we will be one flesh. That is the context that God intends for sex, amen, is in marriage, is in forever covenant, okay? Anytime sex is happening outside of that forever covenant, it is going to be something that brings sorrow. It is going to be something that brings pain, that brings twisting up of your soul. It's going to bring perversion. It's going to bring bondage. It's going to bring just hurt and, and not good things, amen? Because this is what it was intended for, okay? So you take two human beings and you pry them apart. What is the only kind of glue that can stick them back together again? Sex, right? Now, sex is the merging of body, soul, and spirit all at the same time. Okay? Someone say body, soul, and spirit. Okay? This is where people don't understand, you know, it's like we we watch in our world, people are getting further and further and further away from this design. Amen? Do you see it? Okay. And they start to justify, and they're just like, you know what, it's just not realistic, and, you know, like, this is just kind of how it is. And so, you know, just, you know, use protection, and you'll be okay. Or we just, like, you know, look at our kids, and we're like, you know what, in this day and age, you know, it's like we all come from monkeys anyway, And so we're all animals, and so we're just going to lower our expectations. So here's some contraceptives, and you guys just don't get pregnant and don't get a disease. Now, how many of you know that no condom on this planet will stop the merging of soul and spirit? There is no contraceptive. There is no pill that you can take that will stop the merging of body, soul, and spirit. Okay? And outside of covenant, what happens is that those merge together... And the glue works, and then you rip those two apart, and then they merge with somebody else, and then you rip those two apart, and they merge with somebody else. What is going to happen over time? It's a mess. It's bondage, right? That's, that's something that we do a lot in deliverance ministries. We, we break ungodly soul ties. Your soul ties up with somebody when you merge with them in that way, okay? And so, like, that's... That's the issue is that you're merging body, soul, and spirit with all of their generational stuff, blessings and cursings, right? And so when you rip away from them and you attach to someone else and all of their generational cursing and blessings and all the critters that they have and then the next one and the next one and the next one. Now, how many of you know that kids, you know, these days are talking about body count, right? It's like that brings bondage 
And then you wonder why, you know, sometimes a husband will be like, I just can't forget that one lady. And my soul feels tied to her. I just can't stop thinking about her, right? Why is that? It's because God's glue works, right? You are merged together, body, soul, and spirit. And those things have to be severed when, you know, you break apart. And we just don't want to walk in that kind of bondage. Does that make sense? No shame on you. No condemnation, no shame, okay? These things can be broken. We can factory reset back to what God intended. Um, but it's really important that we understand this, that this is not just something that we can toy around with. This is something that God intended to be very powerful. It is a spiritual experience every single time. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, Now, notice at the end of that scripture, it says that the two will become one flesh, and then verse 25 says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Someone say naked and not ashamed. <laughs> naked and not ashamed is what God always intended. That was always his intent, okay? Um, yeah, amen. Amen. Sex is blessed by God and anointed by God in the safety of a marriage covenant. Sex existed before sin. Did you guys know that? Sex existed before sin. Sex is sacred and holy. It is one of the most sacred, holy things that you can participate on this planet. Now, why do you think the enemy wants to twist and pervert it and make it cause people pain? It's because it is one of the most sacred, holiest things that we can do on this planet. Amen? Um, it belongs to God. Um, the Bible has over 200 verses about sexual intimacy, and there's an entire book about marital love called The Song of Solomon, and it is not rated PG. <laughs> it's not. Mm -hmm. God blesses sex in the context of marriage, amen? Okay? It was God's idea to give married couples a gift that is amazing, deeply connecting, fun, euphoric, powerful bonding that drives them back together in unity as one flesh again and again in such a way that it is covenant reinforcing and even so powerful it is life creating. Amen? How many of you know it's powerful? Okay? And yet, what do we typically hear about sex when we're younger? It's sin. It's dirty. Your parts are dirty. Don't even talk about them. Don't look at them. You can get a disease. You can get pregnant. Don't do it. Don't talk about it. It's dirty. It's shameful. It's wrong. It's associated with the devil. That's the devil's business. But have you ever heard of that? That's the devil's business, right? So save it for your husband. <laughs> right. And so we wonder why sometimes married couples have a hard time, right? Some, sometimes we have to be careful in the purity movement that we don't go too far with this and that we make sex shameful. Let's come to the vision that God has. Amen? I can't believe you want to do that. That's so dirty. You're so perverted. You just want to do that, and that's terrible. So save that for your wife. <laughs> it's just like, no, let's, let's come back to God's vision, okay? Um, back to the beginning. God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? God says there's one tree, one job that they had, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does the devil do? Tries to get them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he lies and deceives them, and he says, no, God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be like him, and here's the lie. They were already like him, amen? He doesn't want you to be like him. This is going to make you wise. This is going to bring good things to your life. And so the very most original lie ever was God is holding out on you. That there is stuff that you can access outside of God's wisdom, outside of his instruction, that is going to make you wiser, that's going to make you better, that's going to make you stronger. And that is the original lie. Amen? And then what happened right after they ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? They suddenly saw that they were naked, and they were ashamed, and that is not what God wanted, okay? So then they covered their parts up with fig leaves, and then they ran and they hid from God, okay? Now, that was the moment that sex and shame got tied together, was in that moment with sin, was like, oh, you know, I, I, this is shameful, 
okay? That was the moment that it became twisted and perverted, and it was this thought that somehow outside of God and his wisdom and his instruction, there's life for me. There's, there's something good that I could attain that he's holding out on me. And that is the original lie, and that's the thing that we need to unpartner with in this world, okay? Because we are fed a steady diet of sex means this and sex means that, and this is okay, and that's okay, and this is not okay, and that's not okay. And we have to come back to the factory reset of what God intended it for. This is a mind renewal even for me to review what did God intend this for and the things that we just subtly accept that are pushed so hard, okay? How, how many of you know that um, sex in our culture is like a God? It's like a little G God, Right? It, it's, it's something that we look to to give us identity. You know, man, you, you are a masculine man if you can sleep with all these women, right? Or you are a feminine girl if all these men want to, to you know, give you sexual attention. You know, that's something that I grew up with and watching movies and stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to be that thing, but it also feels wrong. But also, if you get male attention, then that means that you're doing a good job as a woman, right? Do you see the identity messages that come into this? Okay. Why does it hit our identity so hard? Is because the scripture that says that God uses um, sex between a man and a woman as his um, view of, uh, of Christ and the church. Amen? So there is an identity message in sex. But what happens is that we rise up in pride and we start to worship the creation as a God instead of ruling over it. And anything that you are worshiping will rule over you. Does this make sense? And then... That is why you see, you know, church leaders falling, marriages breaking apart because of affairs and pornography and, and stuff like that, because people are being ruled over that which they are supposed to rule over, that which is supposed to be a blessing to them. Amen? And so it's really important to understand that you cannot get value from sex. I don't care who you are. We, we talk like this is only for singles and teenagers, and like, this is for everybody. <laughs> this is for married people. You know, like, we, we want to keep our hearts pure and our thoughts pure. What does pure mean? Surrendered. Not perfect, but surrendered, right? And we treat purity like it's this achievement. Like, if I can just, you know, just make it to the edge of the cliff without falling off, but go as far as I possibly can, right? And we're not even processing our thoughts and our hearts and the, and the things like that. And, like, Jesus is looking at our hearts. And, of course, he loves us. There's no condemnation. But we want to be, you know, on the altar as a living sacrifice. Amen? Like, we want to be surrendered to him. Amen? We want our thoughts to line up. I don't want to be tormented by thoughts. Amen? But purity is not an achievement. We think, like, oh, if I could just, I mean, that's, that's the lie. That's the trap, right? If I could just stop desiring to have sex, then I will be pure. It's like, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> If, if that happened, like, then something's wrong, right? So, like, God gave you a sex drive. It's okay. It's okay to, to want to do that, right? But you need to manage your appetite. Amen? You need to, to manage your appetite. This goes for married people, too. You need to manage your affections towards your spouse. And it's something that you need to do with vision and that you need to do with intention. Amen? Especially in this day and age. Okay? Purity is not an achievement. It's always something you're going to be pursuing, okay? And I, I'm not just pursuing purity in my thoughts and things just to please Daniel, which, of course, I want to please Daniel. I want to be faithful to him, but I do it out of my relationship with the Lord. Amen? And it, it might not be perfect, but that's okay. My heart is surrendered. I'm like, God, I, I want to pursue purity. It is a forever pursuit. Amen? And it is pure in the context of marriage, and it's good. And God blesses it. And he says, enjoy this. You're going to love it. Amen? Amen. Okay. Someone say, purity is a pursuit. It is not an achievement. No one is going to arrive. I'm pure now. <laughs> no one is going to do that. It comes back to what we talked about last week, you know, taking thoughts captive. Right? Just because you have a thought doesn't mean that you've sinned. Right? There's temptations that come. 
If you sit and linger on that thought, you let your eyes wander and linger, right, then that's something different. And all it does is just stir up more bondage for ourselves and makes it more difficult to do. Amen? Okay? It's, this is important stuff. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, this is some grown-up talk. <laughs> this is some grown-up talk. Mm-hmm. God is not holding out on you. He's not holding out on you. He loves you, and he wants you to have the best of this life can offer. Amen? Okay? Um, let's put on the screen Romans 1.20. Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What is that saying is that God speaks through his creation and tells us who he is, okay? So, um, so there's no excuse to say there's no God and I just didn't know. Like essentially it's like look around. How could you not see that there is a divine creator? Amen. Look at a mountain. When you look at a mountain, God is saying look at how huge I am. When you look at the microscopic insects and bacteria and DNA, you're like, oh my gosh, look at how intricate God is. He's amazing. He cares about the smallest detail. When you look at the planets, right? Have, have you guys ever watched? I almost showed it today. But there's this thing that shows you how big the earth is, and then it's dwarfed by the next planet, by the next planet, by the next star, the next star, and the next star, to where the sun is like microscopic compared to some of the other stars that we even know of in the universe, right? And it says in the Bible, God breathed those out. Like, no big deal. <sighs> Here's planets bigger than you can even wrap your brain around, right? Your human brain, right? Like, he's amazing. And he, he speaks through that. Look at how huge and majestic I am. Amen? So one of his favorite images that he likes to use is a married couple engaged in sex. And that's what he says, I am like that. It says in Ephesians, I'll prove it to you. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Okay? So male and female, married, in covenant, together as one flesh. He says, that's what I'm like with my church. What does that mean? He loves his church. He can't get enough of his church. That is his metaphor. Amen? I can't wait to be with her. Do you guys know that we're going to a wedding in the end, right? We're the, we're, we're the bride. He's the bridegroom. He can't wait. Amen? He can't wait to be with us. That's how he feels. And he's like, look at that, and you know who I am. Amen? It's powerful, and it's pure, when we use it intended the way he intended, amen? All right. Um, marriage and sex are not a social construct. It's the way in which God has chosen to reveal himself. Amen? Isaiah 62, 5 says, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. How does a young bridegroom feel about his bride? Some people are blushing. <laughs> I can't wait to be with her. I've been waiting a long time. This is how God feels about you. Amen. And he uses that message of sex in marriage, okay, in a forever covenant, okay? Again, this is why any other image other than male and female in forever covenant coming together is inherently anti-Christ, and I don't mean that to shame anybody. I don't mean, like, if that's something that you struggle with, with same-sex attraction or, you know, transgender, you know, stuff, this is not meant to shame. This is meant to bring back to factory reset. This is what God intended because he's a good God and because he's speaking something. How many of you know that your bodies are not just biological? Your bodies are theological. Your bodies are theological. He speaks through the creation of our bodies. Look at the male body. It is, it speaks of giving, right? And the female body speaks of receiving. Is that not like Christ in the church? Amen? 
implanting the word, and that gets sprouted up, and the bride grows that word, right, and brings forth life, brings forth fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Do you see how anything other than that image is inherently anti-Christ? And that is the spirit that you see behind some of the spiritual aspects of that movement, is that it is very anti, anti-Jesus, okay? I mean, really looking at our world in general right now, nobody cares if you talk about Buddha, nobody cares if you talk about Muhammad, nobody cares about if you talk about Allah or, you know, any other, you know, Shiva, you know, all the things, Ganesh, nobody cares. If you talk about God, nobody cares. If you talk about Jesus Christ, people take offense, right? And it it shouldn't surprise us because we are in a war, and it is a war for the mind and for souls. It's not a war where we're going to shoot people and say Jesus or die, (laughs) right? But it is a war between Christ and Antichrist. That's the two spirits in this world. It's Christ and Antichrist. There is not another option. Amen? Amen. All right. Someone say, my body is theological. Mm -hmm. All right. Imagine a world. I want you to close your eyes. Imagine a world. Don't fall asleep. Promise me you won't fall asleep. Imagine a world where there was no pornography, where there's no premarital sex. It's not even an option. There's no affairs. There's no prostitution. There's no one-night stands. There's no hookup websites. There's no self-gratification. There's no lustful thoughts. The only sexual outlet for humans was marriage. What would that be like? Everybody would be married. (laughs) Everybody would be married and probably be married a little sooner. Amen? Okay? People would have a high motivation for working things out, for getting counseling, for praying together when their marriage was going through tough times. If that was the only option, right, the world would look quite different. Amen? Now, how many of you know that that is actually what God intends, right? That, that sex is the driving force for the man and the woman to come back together, So that when there's fighting, when there's disagreements, when, oh, gosh, you know, that one driving force. So if that gets extinguished through pornography or through affairs or whatever, what happens to that married couple? Where's the glue? Right? Amen. That's why it's really, really important to understand this is a good thing in the right context. Amen? All right. Sex and marriage cannot be separated. Someone say they can't be separated. They were never meant to be two separate things. How many of you know that a marriage is not considered legal until it's consummated? So it is not marriage without sex. Amen? Okay? And also, God intended that sex would only happen in covenant in marriage. The two cannot be separated. Amen? All right. Biblically, there's no grounds for separating marriage and sex. Okay? Why? Because God loves you. Because God loves you. Because it's powerful and it can only be safe and deeply satisfying in the protection of a forever covenant. Amen? It's a supernatural act. It's a marriage every single time, uniting body, soul, and spirit and merging them together with someone else supernaturally. Amen? Outside of covenant, this interaction is still taking place every time you engage in sexual things, including pornography. You are bonding to it. Amen? Okay? Um, this is not just about consequences in the natural. There is, there is mental and emotional and spiritual consequences. Amen? All right. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20 says, run from sexual sin. Everybody say, run. <laughs> run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Amen? 
okay? Now, what does it say with sexual immorality? There's multiple places in the Bible. It says, run. It says, flee, <laughs> right? Some people will say, I really need to conquer lust. I really, like, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm battling lust. I'm battling this, this thing. I don't want to have these impure thoughts or whatever. The Bible never says to battle it. It never says to conquer it. It says to run. It says run. Run away. <laughs> okay? So in other words, don't get entangled with it. Amen? Like, run the other way. Look the other way, right? If, if Victoria's secret's bothering you, like, and she's not keeping her secrets, look the other way. Run away, right? Like, you do not want to be tormented. Like, it's, it's kind of like, what do you expect? Like, you, you, you're not going to look at that and not be tempted. Amen? So just run, right? It reminds me of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Do you guys remember the story of Joseph? And he was, you know ripped off by his brothers, and then he's in, you know, Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife, she was probably good looking, right? And she's just like, why don't you come and do this with me? And he's like, no, this would be wrong. You're his wife. And then he's like, and I don't want to sin against God. Amen. He's walking in the fear of the Lord. I don't want to do this to my God. I have relationship with God. I don't want to break his heart. Amen. So no, I'm not going to do that. And he doesn't discuss it with her. That tells me she was probably good looking, because if it were easy, if she was not good looking, I don't think he would have ran. But he, he runs, right? He's like, oh, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of this situation, right? Someone say, run, run, run from entanglements, right? Run from the girl at the office that makes you feel alive, right? Run from that man that cracks you up at work, right? Run, 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 run. Don't get entangled. Amen? Amen. Run. Avert your eyes. Be really careful with your eye gate. I'm saying this because I love you. This is not judgment. It's not condemnation. It's certainly not legalism. I can't watch a lot of the shows on TV today. I can't because I don't want to struggle with lustful thoughts, and I'm going to run the other way right? Like, I, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm a mature Christian. I can, ha I mean, like, so many TV shows right now are pretty much softcore porn. I'm just going to say it like it is, right? You guys, can we handle this in church? Okay. I would not be able to handle that and not be tormented by thoughts. I'm not going to say, oh, I've conquered lust. I'm pure. I can watch that and it's okay. I can't. I cannot. And I don't want to be tormented by thoughts. So I run the other way, right? We, we need to know when, know when to hold them, <laughs> know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Amen. Amen. Purity is not an achievement. It is a constant pursuit. Amen. All right. Um, here's, here's the problem with sexual sin is that it's a sin against your own body. It's a sin against your own body. Whether you know it or not, your body knows, your soul knows, your spirit knows right? It is a sin against your own body. It causes you to dissociate from your own body. Amen? It sets you up for, like, let's say you're single or you're, you're a young person. This kind of stuff sets you up for pain in marriage, where it's like, that's not going to be satisfying to you because you have bonded with this other thing. You've learned to dissociate from your body, Okay, the most important thing in sex in marriage is that you are connected to your spouse, amen, in intimacy, and that I'm not dissociating. Does this make sense? Okay, we're going there, okay? That you are actually connected emotionally, mentally with your spouse, and that that is happening during that. Does this make sense? How many of you know that really great marriages and really strong families are the thing that's going to change this world? Amen? Because so many people are so hopeless when they look around. They're just like, oh, gosh, like, this is not possible. Like, look at all the marriages failing. Look at all the church leaders falling. This is possible because God's word says that it is. Amen? So we want to go after this with some vision and with some intention. Amen? Amen. Someone say amen. Mm-hmm. If it's a sin against your own body, then it's a sin against the other person's body, too. Amen? It's a sin against the body of Christ. Okay, how many of you would know when we see church leaders falling into sexual sin, it's a sin against the entire body of Christ. You see young people falling away and like, what is happening? Getting disillusioned, right? 
And it's really important that we understand that Jesus died to set us free from the penalty of sin. Amen. Jesus still loves us. And when you're born again, he still loves us. You're going to heaven. But he also died to set us free from the bondage of sin. Amen. He didn't just die to set us free from the penalty, but also we can overcome sin and not be entrapped by it. Amen. Amen. What he did is powerful. Someone say what he did is powerful. Okay. Now, what happens when we make sex a little G God and we're trying to get our identity from sex? Where it's just like, oh, I, I will finally feel worthy of love if I get XYZ attention from men. Or I will finally feel capable and masculine if I can get attention from all these women. Um, then we make sex this like little G God and um, we become ruled over by it. Amen. We become ruled over by it, and we are trying to accomplish something selfish in something that is meant to be given as a gift to your partner. Does that make sense? I'm looking for an identity hit, okay? I don't care if you are straight in this. I don't care if you're doing this in a homosexual relationship. You are using someone else's body to get an identity hit, and it is not okay to use someone's body that way even if they consent to it. So again, that's when we take a look at homosexuality and we say, you know, we love you so much, but you're actually hurting that other person because your body, soul, and spirit was not meant to be tied up and merged with someone of the same sex. Does this make sense? Okay? I love you. It is loving to say this. Okay? If you see someone in a burning building... And you're like, but they're happy. <laughs> but they're fine with it. They don't know it's on fire, right? You, you need to, to, to say something, right? It's, it's, it's actually not loving. We, we need to let God define what love is. Amen? God is love, right? And then people will say, well, I, you can love who you want to love. And what's the difference if people just love who they want to love? It's not love to use someone else's body for an identity hit. It will never hit it. Sex cannot give you your identity. It never will. You will be in pain and you will be chasing that for the rest of your life just like any other drug. Amen? It is not kind and loving to say, oh, they're happy. Right? It's like, let's get them out of the building. Right? But they're okay with it. It's like, that's not loving. Amen? Now, I'm not saying go stand on a street corner with a sign and say, turn or burn. <laughs> that is not what I'm saying. But in, in our relationships with people and when, when people ask and we, we feel that bridge from Holy Spirit to share our faith, it's okay to share these things, okay? Now, here's the thing is that you can't clean a fish before you've caught it. This isn't something where it's like, you have to be pure, you have to give up this lifestyle, you have to give up that sin and that sin or whatever in order for you to receive grace from Jesus. That's not the case. You need to receive his free gift of righteousness so that he can clean you. Amen? So we don't need to, to hold up a, a trip sign where it's like, oh, you can't get saved until you, you know, X, Y, Z. Does that make sense? That applies to any sin. Amen? All right. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. So God's vision for sex, the world perverts it, religion shames it, but God celebrates it. Amen. God celebrates it. God's vision is for us to walk in purity our entire lives, not just getting to that marriage finish line. Amen. God's vision is for us to walk in purity, for us to only ever engage sex with one person through a blood covenant, for us to go forth and be fruitful in the context of a loving, honoring, covenanted marriage where we feel safe and protected to give ourselves to one another freely, wholeheartedly, and enjoy a wonderful, pure, beautiful, holy, fun, wholesome, enjoyable, passionate, healthy sex life that is not defiled by perversion or haunted by impure images of things that are sinful or bring shame or comparison. 
pure, completely connected, body, soul, and spirit, fully present, unashamed, always being satisfied with one another. In this unselfish love, there is a pinnacle of pleasure that is so sacred and powerful that it actually produces new life. This vision is possible, and we must pursue this vision and wage war on anything that argues with that in our minds. Amen? Amen. Society is not overdoing it with sex. It is underselling sex. Pornography has nothing on the real thing. One night stands and flings has nothing on the real thing. Amen? God designed it. It is amazing the way he designed it. Amen? Again, no shame on you. No shame. We have to battle for this. Amen? We don't need to lower our standards. We actually need to cast more vision to our young people of what it's supposed to be. Amen? We're going to have to talk about it. Amen? Did you know that uh, I think the majority of kids discover pornography by the time they're 11? right? We need to talk about sex with our kids. We need to cast vision for why it's good. We need to cast vision for why their bodies are worth saving, why that is something worth saving for a spouse, okay? Now, just because you save that for a spouse does not mean, oh, your marriage is going to be magical and it's just going to work and it's going to be so easy. Like, that's not the case, right? We're always going to need to manage our appetites. We're always going to need to position our hearts toward our spouse and, you know, work through things and all that kind of stuff. But that is um, the intention that God had. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yay, yay, yay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're going to read this scripture. And um, part of the reason that we're reading this is because I've had a lot of young people ask me, um, does the Bible really say that? Um, about sex and about homosexuality and things like that. So we're just going to read scripture on this. And again, this is no condemnation or shame, but we do need to be exposed to truth and what God's heart is. Amen. Um, So if we can put on the screens Romans 1, 21 to 32, and we're going to read this together. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie... And worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. In other words, they worshipped sex, right? The creation. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, Insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinances of God, uh, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That is how God feels about these types of things. Now, Jesus came to die on a cross to set us free from the penalty of all of those things, okay? So it is important to understand that those things are covered under the blood. But what grace does not mean is that Jesus came and died on a cross so that I can look at pornography now. That is called perversion. We cannot call bondage freedom, And say, okay, now homosexuality is okay because God's winking at it because of what Jesus did on the cross. 
it's not true. You know, those that do not know Jesus Christ will be punished for all of these sins. So why would we want to do the same things that people are going to be punished for if they find themselves without Jesus on the last day? Does this make sense? Amen. Again, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. There is no shame. But we do need a factory reset back to the voice of truth that says this is actually what God intended, and it's because he loves us. It's because he wants what's best for us, because he wants to bless marriage, because he doesn't want to see broken families and fatherless generations, because he doesn't want to see families broken apart by affairs and pornographies, because he doesn't want to see ministries fall and businesses fall and all these different things because people can't, you know, walk in purity. Amen? There's been too many people that have been robbed by trying to use sex in a way that God never intended them. And he's like, hey, that is not a toy. Amen? This is not for selfish gratification. It's not for these things. It's not for comfort. It's not for, you know, all all these different things that we would use God for, right? It's like a counterfeit God, right? This is not to give you an identity hit. This is not for your self-esteem. This is glue that keeps a married couple together and it's for them to enjoy and to create life in, period. Amen? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Let's just close our eyes. I know that this is going to be something, even, even for me, that's like it brings me to a place of repentance of even some things that I'm just like, oh, gosh, you know, like that, that we let slide or that we let the, see, the, the kids see on TV or, you know, whatever. It's like there's, there are so many messages that are hidden in, in all of these things in our culture. But the original lie that we have to come back to is this lie that somehow God is holding out on you that he's not really good, that he just doesn't want you to have fun, that he just, uh, that you can actually get your desires met outside of his guidance, that you can just be your own source. And that's actually what Adam and Eve did. They became their own source. They're like, we're going to decide what's good and what's bad. And look at our world today. It's broken. The the highest suicide rates are among those that, that struggle with homosexuality. And it's not because of Christians making them feel guilty. It's like his, his word is written on our hearts. We know if every Christian on the planet died today, there would still be guilt and shame around that because your body was not designed for that. And I'm telling you this because I love you, right? So if you find yourself that you feel like you're being ruled over by things you're actually supposed to rule over, we're just going to do something really simple today. We're just going to factory reset And just go back to God, you are my source. I'm just, I'm coming back to the voice of truth. God, you are my source. So just in your own heart, in your own way, just even put your hands out in front of you, like as a sign of surrender. It's just like, God, you, you're the one, you're the source. I I give up my little arguments and my things or even compromises or, or whatever. And I just say, God, you are my source. And I know that so many struggle with addictions in this area, and that's something that I struggled with too. And God has so much love and compassion for you, so much love and compassion, and he has freedom for you. He didn't just die to set you free from the penalty. He set you free from the weight of it, from the dominance of it in your life. You do not have to struggle with these things. So, Lord, I pray right now for anyone that's struggling with addictions in these areas or perversions or just whatever. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would come in right now and do what only you can do. Voice of truth, that you would ring true, bring us back into alignment with your word. Bring us back into alignment with who you are. And I thank you, Lord, that you are such an amazing redeemer, that you can restore purity. You can restore our minds, that nobody's too far gone. So I just ask you even right now to restore purity, to restore, Father, even that sense of, of, um, of worth. Like some of us have even like felt like worthless after some of the experiences we had. That is not of you, Lord. It's not for us to feel worthless, Lord. I pray that you would come in, Father, and that you would pour out your love on us, that we would give uh, you our attention, and that you would speak worth and identity over your people right now. In Jesus' name, 
And so many of you were exposed to things that you should not have been exposed to, even at very young ages. And God has so much compassion for that. That was actually abuse. Like, you, you didn't even set out to seek those things. You just stumbled on it. And it's like, God has so much grace for that. And he wants to set you free from that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would go in right now, Father, and that you would bring people to that place of just repentance. We're just, we're thinking differently now. And, Lord, I pray that you would shut every door to lust right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah, and that you would shut every door of shame and every accusation of the enemy that would say, oh, you're unclean or you're too far gone or you've just blown it or whatever. I thank you, God, that it is never too late. And we just thank you, Father, that your redemption is so great that we would almost think that you meant for us to go through the things we went through because you are so good at turning things around for our good. And I thank you that you are turning things around. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for it. Yeah. So let's just all just say this together. God, I've made myself the source. I thought I knew better than you did. I want to put you back in your rightful place. I choose to trust you that your ways are higher, you're better and more fulfilling than my ways. I choose to surrender my sexuality to you. I reject the lie and the narrative of the world. And I nail it to the cross in Jesus' name. Yeah, I thank you, Lord. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just give people truth right now to hang on to. I feel like he's going to start speaking to your heart. He's going to say kind, loving things over your heart right now. And so, Lord, we just receive your truth right now, that we are already loved, that we are already like you, that you have so much for us, God, and we just give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.